welcome, Stephen, uh, to uh, the Sum Zero channel. Um, we've got a lot to talk about today. You've been uh, one of the most prolific Sum Zero members since our founding. I think I checked; you had over almost thirty ideas on the platform over the years. Um, and so it's it's great to to chat in person and and uh, to kind of pick your brain a little bit on on different value opportunities. Um, I guess to start out with, you're you're known for being um, uh, focused on Eastern Europe. Uh, and one of the names we're going to talk about today is, is actually a Romanian company, uh, which we can get into later. But do you want to maybe just give us a quick bio on, on yourself, how you got into investing and, and, and your focus on Eastern Europe? Sure. Thank you, Divya. And first, I want to start, say, but as you correctly mentioned, I've been following some zero pretty much, I think, from the beginning. And it's amazing to see the community that you guys have built over the years and how helpful it's been. And for me, it's been both source of ideas and a source of connections. And I'm very thankful for what you guys have done and to continue contributing to it going forward. So thank you for that. Um, I guess uh, starting out from um, Eastern Europe, as you correctly pointed out, uh, the fund that I work with, Firebird Management, is uh, best known for investing in Eastern Europe. I've been with the fund for 16 years. The fund has been around since 1994, so I think it's 27 at this point. And um, the history of the markets that we've been investing in is quite fascinating. Um, we, uh, so back in 1994, uh, the markets have started out from voucher privatizations in places like Russia, which was really a case of taking a uh, centralized economy and uh, giving everybody a chance to invest into it through a piece of paper that most people didn't really under who were there. And my family was actually on the ground. I'm originally from Belarus. Uh, so we got those pieces of paper and most people had no idea what that means because like, what does it mean to own a piece of a company? What does it mean to open a piece of the economy? We're just used to getting a salary that was determined by somewhere, somewhere up when everybody's salary was more or less the same. So that was a, there was a concept that was pretty foreign to the locals, but some of the foreigners, including the founders of our fund, have saw the opportunity that it presented because, and I think this is a pretty famous story, that the value of the whole Russian economy, which is one sixth of the earth's surface and everything that comes with it, all of the natural resources and everything's there, it was valued at somewhere between five and nine billion dollars which at this point, it, it, it seems ridiculous. Almost laughable, yeah. It was laughable. And the people who saw that as an opportunity, they uh, went in and uh, they were able, they were trying to find ways to buy up these vouchers because there was a kind of third party market for these vouchers and to use them to, um, to bid on the shares of some of the companies that we what's still the around. timeline you're talking about here? What, what's the time frame? 94. This is 1994. 94, okay. Yeah, and they've used those vouchers to put uh, to bid on the assets that turned out uh, turned into companies. Some of which some of those companies are still around today. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the beginning of the market. And the early '90s was quite it was an uh, interesting time to be there because you had uh, market going up hundreds of percents, and then 1998, uh, pretty much everything crashed. And but that was uh, the the wild east beginning, but yeah. after that, uh, what we as a firm have done, which was quite different from uh, what a lot of our, you know, uh, I guess, uh, cont contemporaries have done, we decided to go to other markets in Eastern Europe. And we became one of the first investors in Romania, one of the first investors in the Baltic countries, and one of the first investors in Georgia, and really looking all over the region. And Though that gave us exposure to markets that are quite different uh, than what you consider to be like Russia, which is at the time was a resource based market. Uh, it gave us exposure to markets that became uh, uh, that had an element of convergence with Western Europe. They were these are the countries that soon after that became parts of European Union. Later on, some of them decided to join the euro. So we got access to these really interesting open economies that were growing very fast with relatively underdeveloped public markets. And uh, once again, we were going in there and finding the companies and looking, and for us, one of the core things, how we look at companies, because we have a long-term investment approach is we take somewhat of a private equity type approach and we look at, we try to understand how the cash flows are made, what is the competitive advantage? 
and most importantly, how they're being spent. And this is uh, kind of the transition that we've seen um, in terms of how the money is being spent and how the companies understand what the money is that they're generating. That's a transition that we saw happen over the last 20 years. And it's absolutely amazing because the starting point uh, 25 years ago was, uh, as I already mentioned, with these were economies where not a lot of people understood what, uh, what, kind of what it means to get a return on capital. But they quickly learned. And we saw a learnings within the companies that we're investing in. We saw that learning happen over time. We saw, we saw that and we saw companies making better and better and better investment decisions that is translating into better companies that we're able to invest today. There was so, a couple of- I'm just curious, like just to give a little bit of uh, context for folks who are listening, like in the United States, um, when we look at the public markets, people tend to be anchored to call it a, a price to earn, a price to, you know, PE ratio of like, let's say 20 to 25 times, especially now with low rates that multiples gone up. Historically, it's been a little bit lower. In a country like Romania, like what is the market earnings multiple look like? Single digits. Right. I mean, that just sort of says it all. That's, that's, um, well, there, you know, there, there's a sec there's a second element to that that I want to point out because I, I think you, you're touching on a very important point. Because so in today, if we look at uh, Russia or, or Romania, then the PE is seven, eight times. And now, uh, but we, there was another period back in 2000. 2003, 2004, when the PE of the market was also seven to eight times. At that time, the dividend yield of our markets, of the companies we're investing, was around 1%, 1 to 2%. Today, we have the same PE, but the dividend yield is around six. So that's the part that I was talking about, is that the capital allocation decision, so the earnings have, were always there. The multiple was low before. But the quality of the earnings that you're getting and what the company is doing, what the companies are doing with that cash has changed tremendously over the last 20 years. Is that and that's true? the thing that the market, I think the market is missing completely. Is that true across Eastern Europe or is that Romania specifically? Uh, we see high dividend yields in a lot of places. Uh, so I think each market is different. So it's very hard to speak about, you know, something that is true for all of Eastern Europe. Like, so, for example, Poland is a very different market from Romania because they have a very well-developed domestic investor base that's been there forever, and we can get into why. But it is definitely true for places like the Baltic countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Romania, Russia, pretty much most of the places that we're investing in, the dividend yields are quite high. And, 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 at, and at a very high level, how do you get comfortable from just a, you know, a corporate governance standpoint and... and minority shareholder rights, um, you know, as a minority investor, sure. investing in sort of these frontier markets? Those are important. That's, that's a very important question. That's the one that we're spending quite a bit of time on. And once again, I would have to make a distinction between different countries that we're investing in. So for example, if we're talking about Romania or the Baltic countries, those are the countries that are in European Union and have a very similar set of rules and set very similar set of laws and enforcement as you would have in Belgium or in Germany or in France, you know, pick any Western European country. Mm -hmm. So the legal systems are developed, the rights are that you have as a shareholder, once again, depending country by country are there and are enforceable and you can defend your rights through the, through the court of law just like you could in any other country. Mm -hmm. um, in places like Russia and Kazakhstan, I think one of the things that people are completely missing is that the laws protecting the minority investors in places like that are very well developed. They're some of the best in the world. And if you ever have to uh, enforce your, uh, if, the, if the corporate for some reason is doing something that is you know, unholy or not right, you can go through, and if your case is clear, like we had a case, one case where a company just decided not to pay us dividends while paying it to the controlling shareholder. So we went to the local court and we said, okay, this is not right. And they said, yes, absolutely. And we got paid. Um, so those cases, so the legal systems there exist. And in the cases that are clear, they will, def they're, uh, you know, 
you can use them. But you also have to understand how are the assets are created and how complicated are they to run. Because sometimes when an asset has an original sin in the way that it was created, that it has a way, uh, it opens up room for predation from, uh, from an, a, another actor that could put that asset at risk at some point. And that's something that we, by being in the market for over 20 years, we kind of know these stories. And, and we, how big a player is Firebird in this market? I mean, first of all, what, what's the a, AUM uh, at Firebird? About 600 million. And I'm assuming that puts it in sort of the top quartile, if not the top decile of yeah. funds. Exactly. Yeah. So like, are, do you ever find yourself competing with um, established like U.S. firms that have global presence or, I mean, what, I'm just curious from an asset manager standpoint, like who do you run into in that part of the world? Like who, who what are the big names and, and players? It's, of this fine. It, it's fine. You know, competing is a strong word. We welcome participation from uh, established players in, in that uh, part of the world because the, the world is under, our part of the world is underinvested. That's the reason right. why we see in seven and eight P's is because it's just for the longest time being underweight emerging markets and within that being underweight Eastern Europe was the right, right, right. way to play it. Right. Uh, so we don't see a lot of uh, traditional, a lot of institutional uh, capital from the from global players coming in. Yeah. Um, that's actually been changing this year. It's uh, this year it has been the reverse because you know Russia has doing relatively, Eastern Europe is doing relatively well while uh, Asian markets and China in particular is underperforming. So you kind of, you starting to see people pop up once again and coming into the market and looking at our companies. Um, Before we get into specific stocks, um, if there is one, um, let's say primary reason that would explain why now is the time to jump into Eastern Europe, um, what would you say that that reason would be? I think it's the quality of corporates. Is that it's something that is being unappreciated by the market, and we're seeing that from the multiples that we discussed. Uh, what you saw, especially over the last ten years, when the access to capital was quite uh, dire within those markets, uh, you saw quality of the corporates improve dramatically. And uh, so, I mean, we can go into details in terms of okay, here's these great companies with great resources. You can go into detail uh, trading at very low prices. We can go into details and talk about, look at these great compounders that have proven time and time again that they can generate uh, profits and can and do, uh, generate uh, growth and do it profitably, which is unlike, you know, not, not something that we're always seeing in the West. So you, we can go case by case, but overall, it's the quality of the companies that we're investing in that is being underappreciated. And I think that's the, that's the thing. That's the number one reason to invest. So, so let's talk about OMV Petrom. I know this is a name that you guys have in your portfolio. So, um, you know, just give us the overview in terms of market cap and, and some of the high level valuation considerations, and then we could dive into, you know, again, why, why you think it's a great opportunity. Sure, and it's a, it's funny that we're talking about it because it's one of the cheaper names in our portfolio. But there's so many other companies that wouldn't have the low multiple, but would still be great investments. But with OMV, um, it's uh, the market cap right now is around six billion dollars. Um, this uh, so before we talk about that, it's a Romanian oil and gas company, integrated oil and gas company, which has both uh, upstream uh, production. They produce oil and gas uh, at this point only in Romania, but also they have downstream. So they have refineries, they have uh, gas stations, they have a uh, gas-powered power plant. Where they take in a large part of the output and convert and converting it into value-added products. Where, where, what exchange does it trade on? It is trading on Romanian stock exchange. Got it. And, and within uh, Romania, is this a pretty well-known brand? Like you would get your gas at the OMV, and most people yes. know about the company. So they are, in terms of gasoline sales, their market share is over forty percent. Wow. Okay. And uh, while they're not, their share of gas stations is only 20%, so it just tells you that their gas stations are the ones. This is, this is basically the Exxon of Romania. It's probably the Exxon and Chevron of Romania. Okay. It's, it's not just the Exxon, it's a few, but yes, okay. exactly. Got it. 
Um, and uh, so from a valuation it's perspective- it's, it's the Coca-Cola of-, of uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, so from a valuation perspective, the company is trading right now at um, below three times EV EBITDA and dividend yield of around 7%. And one of the reasons why you're seeing a trade at such a low price is because of the declining production uh, profile on the upstream operations. So their um, oil and gas production has been coming down by about 5% per year. And so you can kind of see why the multiple is low because you're not sure why, uh, whether that stream of earnings would continue. But I think the mark, what market is missing here completely is the fact that at this point, more than half of their sales, uh, half of their profits, is coming from these downstream operations, from the refinery and from the gas uh, from the gas stations, and those earnings are much more sustainable. They don't depend on their own feedstock; they can get it from anywhere, um, and uh, they actually usually valued much higher by the market. If you look at the companies trading in that space, anywhere else in the world, they would be trading at eight to nine times the EBITDA as opposed to three or four. Got it. Um... What percent of the business is the downstream stuff? So by profit, it's over half at this point. If you normalize, uh, if you just use normalized uh, prices on uh, oil and gas, because you know last year obviously was not a year where they made a lot of money on producing oil, but this year it's quite profitable. So just normalize, normalizing over the cycle, at this point, over half of the profits is coming from downstream. And also the upstream side of the business, there's a number of catalysts happening there that I think is going to change the perception of the company, even within the next six months, because they have a really large project that they are waiting for a couple of things to happen. That is in uh, Romanian deep sea waters that they're actually developing together with Exxon right now, that would increase their uh, reserves by over 50% and significantly change their production profile once it goes into production in, I think, four to five years. Wow. Um, do, th do they have any um, ambitions or plans to expand beyond Romania? Uh, they have a couple of other uh, upstream projects in, uh, in the Black Sea. So they're 50%, 51% owned by this Austrian company only, which is also on its own a oil and gas producer. And uh, it seemed the way that it seems to be working is that they uh, determined that corporate parent has determined that the Black Sea region is the is the home region where the only Petrom, the Romanian company, operates, and elsewhere in the world only operates. Got it. Uh, how uh, significant of a position is this for you guys? Uh, it's a it's a relatively sizable position for us. I think it's around four percent. Uh, in most in our funds, and um, so from a point of view of how diversified our portfolio is, uh, usually at this point, I think top 20, 25 positions for us it represent 80 to 90 percent of the portfolio. We don't have any positions that are over 10 percent of the portfolio, in part because we're dealing with emerging markets. Sure. Yeah. And um, in emerging, we found that being very concentrating in emerging markets is just doesn't work for us. Because there's things that happen, right? Of course. Do do you um, do a lot of exchange rate hedging, um, or do you pretty much just own these we, assets, local currency? We don't. We we own these assets uh, and we take the currency risk. We take the currency risk into account. So, like for example, we have quite a few investments in banks that earn money domestically in the in in local currencies, and when we consider the investments in these banks or in other um, company that is earning in local currency, we take into account the average decline in the currency versus the dollar, because uh, our investors make money, uh, our, our funds are measured in dollar returns. So we take into account the average decline in those currencies over time in making the investment decision. And for a company like OMV, what, what's your timeline? Is there a time horizon you'd expect to own the name for? So we've owned it for over 10 years at this point. Uh, there are uh, but there are specific, with names like that, uh, I think they're somewhat cyclical. So it really depends on some about, in terms of what happens with this company over the next three to five years. Uh, there are specific catalysts that we're waiting for over the next six months that we think will help the company re-rate, specifically related to this um, Black Sea project in the offshore. So they are waiting for a uh, change in the offshore investment law in Romania 
that's been pretty much telegraphed that is going to happen uh, within uh, next six months or so. It's going to be preceded by Exxon more likely than not selling their stake in the project because they determined to be um, just non-core for them. So it's being sold right now. Uh, it's going to be sold before end of November to this other Romanian uh, company, Rongas, which will also establish a value for this project, which will once again show how cheap only Petrom is. So, um, you know, you guys also have a, a U.S. strategy, and <clears throat> you know, I'm just curious um, what part of the process. Um, and diligence effort that you guys put into the European names, would you say transfers best to, to investing in the US? Um, and then maybe you can give us some examples of that. Sure, yeah. So we launched the US strategy nine years ago when we were looking to see where we can apply our cash flow based approach. Uh, where else can we apply it around the world? And uh, for us, we didn't feel comfortable going to another emerging market where we felt that we could probably do decent work fundamentally and try to find good companies, but we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't know what we know in Eastern Europe if we go to Latin America, if we go to Southeast Asia or any of the, these other places. So we didn't want to be the patsy at the table, as Buffett would say, when we go to these other places. And so we felt like, okay, we think that we do some really good work on the fundamental side when we're looking at cash flows and taking a private equity type approach to in investing. Where else can we do it? And because at the time we were all in the United States uh, and doing quite a bit of PA investing, we decided to let's see, let's see if we can formalize uh, how we invest in a different market, what kind of portfolio we can build, and how, and how it would perform over time. So we uh, launched the strategy nine years ago via managed accounts. Uh, it performed reasonably well over the first couple of years, and we uh, turned it into a fund. Well, one of the things I like about what you guys do is, is sort of this. Um, you know, the value approach, but, but finding these opportunities where there, you know, might be a, um, a headline, you know, that's sort of uh, forms this narrative of a melting ice cube or something that's maybe not moving in the right direction and where, where you guys see, you know, you guys have a contrarian viewpoint where you see a turnaround. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, travel back a couple of years. Um, you had posted a piece on some zero about uh, cars.com. Um, and there's been a lot of talk in the news, you know, at least, you know, during the COVID phase of, of used car prices going up like crazy. And there also has been a proliferation of, of websites um, that sell cars and have made, um, you know, have maybe offered an alternative to just going to a traditional dealer. Can you just give us the cars.com story? How you, you know, why did, how did it hit your radar in the first place? Um, and, and, and how you see this company, um, you know, over the next couple of years in terms of its, its own turnaround. Absolutely. So uh, cars.com is a pretty interesting story. It, initially, it was a spin-off from Tegna, uh, which was another name well-known in value circles for quite some time. Uh, so when it spun off, it's the company that uh, we looked at and uh, follow, follow, followed it for a little bit. Um, kind of want to step back for a second and talk about like these uh, melting ice cube type of investments. And I right. uh, think there's an interesting, you touched on earlier talking about low interest rates and uh, in the environment with low interest rates, uh, just from a you know, DCF perspective, right, from a theoretical perspective, a company that is, has a growth rate of minus 2% and versus a company that has a growth rate of two or 3%, has a significantly different value because of how low the interest rates are, are and what it means for the terminal value of the company. And I find that there's actually a pretty interesting niche in the market, not necessarily in these high growth names that everybody's trying to figure out whether this company is gonna grow 20% or 30%. But if you take a company that the market assumes to be declining, that actually is a growth company, even if it's growing three to 4% per year, then when the market re-rates this type of company, that re-rating is going to be significant and will lead to outsized returns. Um, I think cars.com is exactly that type of company. What they had is, and I'm not sure in how much detail we wanna go in here, but they had, this was a company that used to be owned by Tegna, which owned a lot of newspapers and uh, TV stations um, uh, around, around the US. And historically, 
they were the product was actually being sold by the TV stations uh, together with the TV advertising to the dealerships. So they were and what cars.com is a third is a third party marketplace. There's a few of these uh, like there's Cars Guru, there's cars.com uh, and uh, there's uh, Kelly Blue Book. There's a few of, a few of these that are there and options that the people have. So this was a product that never really had its own sales force until it spun off. Uh, once the company spun off, they had the first couple of years where they had to sever these pre-existing relationships with Tecna, where the, their product was being sold to dealerships through uh, Tecna representatives. To the point, and those were a problem because they were this, those sales were an afterthought, essentially as opposed to the main product being sold. But cars.com couldn't go in with their own people. So this is a company from Chicago. They could not sell to Chicago dealerships directly because there was a exclusivity that uh, Tecna had. So they had to break those affiliate relationships. And while they were doing that, they were losing uh, dealerships because you know, I would have been reading some of the transcripts and talking to some dealers. They would say that they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't see their sales rep talking uh, about cars.com for over a year. Well, meanwhile, Cars Guru guy would show up every two months and talk to them. About sure. It. And so it's a like it's something that you can operationally understand. Like part, part of my background is I used to be as operational strategy consultant, so I can you know the, I look for these type of opportunities where I understand the problem that is being solved. And uh, so they had this issue with uh, the decline in number of dealerships, dealership clients. You had competition from Car Gurus that was underpricing. Uh, dramatically. And there's also always the question of, well, can uh, can somebody like Google step in and try to uh, go around these third-party marketplaces and just try to offer services for, uh, comp for dealerships to be uh, marketing more through their own websites? So it's a pretty complicated competitive dynamic here. And- um, But the basic uh, business model, um, just, just to clarify, um, if I'm a, let's say I'm a Mercedes dealership, um, I would pay cars.com to list my inventory on their website. Is that, yeah, exactly. and how does that, what's, do you know what the pricing, um, it's like, what does that fee structure look like typically for a dealership? Uh, so they usually look at what it costs for them based on uh, what they call vehicle display page. So based on how uh, the, like, so you're looking for a car, eventually you will end up at that Mercedes dealer website, how much it costs them for to get you as a person to be looking at their particular car side, uh, side of their car. Uh, and the pricing was, um, so the cheapest way for them for a while was to have uh, people come via own websites. And let's, let's call it, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but let's call it, let's say 10 cents per person showing up. Then Cargurus uh, and something like cars.com cars was around 40 cents. And then um, Cargurus came in and offered a third party aggregator service and it was uh, pricing at very cheap at around 15 to 20 cents. But, and through that they got pretty significant market share and from point of view of the dealers that would usually go with multiple of these marketplaces, not just with one because they just want, they just care about accessing the, uh, wherever the people are, Where, wherever the top of the funnel is, they want to be there. And car gurus were spending quite a bit of time on their own advertising on Google in order to make sure that the clients do show up there. Um, so car gurus initially was the low, uh, cheap option. They came in, they listed, and uh, this was a fa very fast growing company. But after they listed, they started raising their prices. And at this point, they're pretty much on par with cars.com. But cars.com has a pretty interesting advantage because it's cars.com as opposed to car gurus. So, when pe so people, uh, they have a much higher proportion of uh, direct traffic coming to them. Then you have somebody like car gurus where people first go to Google and then car gurus pays uh, for, uh, for that placement in order for people to, uh, to click on their link. So the cost uh, structure for cars.com is actually, uh, they, their cost of advertising is much less. Uh -huh. So through that, the company always generated quite a bit of cash. 
they uh, but the most interesting thing about uh, cars.com is this acquisition that they made a few years ago of the company called Dealer Inspire, which company makes websites for the dealers. And this was, I think, by all means, a very good acquisition for them because they were able to get a what essentially turned into a market leader in uh, websites uh, for dealerships at a very cheap price. And when they got it, I think the market share of the US dealer websites for this company was below 10% and now it's over 20. So they've been gaining share from some of the other people like CDK Global that had relatively, the websites that did not have the same functionality, that weren't as good. These guys just have a better product at the moment. And anytime the dealers can uh, get an option to switch. So GM, for example, before had, was sending everybody, all of their 4,000 dealers to one provider, which was CDK. Once they opened it up to multiple providers, um, Dealer Inspired got more than its fair share of, uh, of those sites. And that has been one of the sources of growth for the company. And one of the more interesting things about it is that by building a website, you also get access to data and where the other uh, customers are coming from, where all of the customers are coming from. And through that, they're able to show that the traffic that they're getting from cars.com is actually very good quality and higher quality than a lot of other sources. So they're using that to upsell their core product as well. So um, cars.com today, uh, what's the top line growth look like? Uh, the top line growth right now, so it went from negative, uh, their um, number of dealers, uh, the number of dealer customers started growing and now it's growing around, I think two to 3% per year. Um, and then their revenue per dealer because of this different value added product is also growing about three to 4% per year. Uh, so in, in total, we can get to about five to 5% uh, per year growth for this company. But also, I mean, our starting point is that this is a company that's very cheap. So the free cash flow yield, this is you know, one of the things that we're looking at. The free cash flow yield today to equity of cars.com is 16% where S&P 500 was around three. Right. So, okay. and, and they've been using, and they've been using the cash that they've been generating over the last couple of years to deliver the company. And at this point have a leverage at a much more comfortable level than they did in the past. Do, do, they, do they pay a dividend? They do not pay. So right now, most of the money is going towards paying down debt, which was admittedly high. It was around uh, at over four times a bit that. Right now they're closer to three. Uh, once they get to below three, they'll be able to think about paying dividends or uh, buying back shares again, if the shares stay anywhere around current level. Uh, any sort of um, upcoming catalyst that you can point to on, on the name? I, every time the company reports earnings, it surprises people how much money it makes. Really? And uh, so like you see it uh, go up and then it kind of uh, after that uh, goes down a little bit. And I think the company market just doesn't trust this company yet. They've had a couple of false starts in the past. So if they will report another couple of quarters where they, you see the number of dealers growing and the revenue per dealer growing, I think this is, this is gonna be the catalyst in itself. So your target price on cars.com is what currently? Around $30, it's a 12. Yeah. Um, so we, we don't, I don't have specific target prices, but I'm just looking from a point of view of uh, if this was anywhere around normal free cash flow yield, where should it be trading and should not be trading at 16%. You, you think the free cash flow yield should be something closer to five? Yeah, for a company like this, five, 6%. Five, 6%, yeah. got it. Um, very interesting. So let's, uh, let's go to um, another name that I think people, at least in the US, like know pretty well. And, and I, I think many would, at least in the non-financial community would question, um, you know, the viability of this name, but Nielsen Holdings, you know, fairly, very liquid stock. Um, you know, I think at least even myself, like I, I always wonder like, how do they actually provide accurate metrics on, you know, <laughs> um, what, what people are watching on television and whatnot. Um, but I know you're a fan of the business um, and, uh, have a $60 target on this name, which I think trades for right around 20 bucks right now. Um, 
What's your thesis on Nielsen? I think this is an interesting one. It's a, there's a couple of things that, so I'll first touch on viability of the business and then kind of there's other things that happened recently that I think make it very interesting today. So from the point, of, so the business today, and it used to be different before, but the business today is pretty much all linked to the, um, these uh, TV ratings that you're seeing uh, both, uh, mostly linked to linear television and TV ratings. So uh, the Nielsen, the famous Nielsen points. And that is the currency in which the advertising is based, uh, the TV advertising is based on, or media advertising is based on. And uh, historically, they, it's, it's coming from these uh, panels that uh, were put into homes of the Nielsen households where people are putting in information and saying, here's what I'm watching, here's what I'm watching here's what I watched before, and it seems like completely outdated and why does it even exist? The, that information, they actually, the company, company Nielsen, it combines it with uh, information that they're getting uh, from elsewhere. And uh, it really comes down to the technology that they have within sampling in order to come up with a single source of truth. And what's very important in this case is the apples to apples comparison between different metrics, uh, between different networks that they're able to tell that you know, on apples to apples basis, it may not be exact, but here's where, uh, you know, here's the, what the audience for this show is, here's what the, what the audience for this show. And then when you go into negotiation with the TV network or with whoever to try to figure out how much you're willing to pay for 30, 30 second spot on pick your favorite TV show, they will have an apples to apples comparison com uh, versus everything else. And while those measurements may not be exact, it's the, it's the single source of truth. And the apples to apples comparison is very important. And to just so, to understand like how weird this market is, is before these panels, which would automatically measure what people are uh, watching with Nielsen, the way that in the 70s and the 80s, the way that the people, uh, the Nielsen households would track their viewing uh, habits is through a notebook where they say that, that they submit it once a month. And um, they would say that this day I watch this, this day I watch that. A lot of these households have probably just filled it out at the end of the month when they had to submit it and kind of had to remember what they watched in the past. So it's like completely imperfect. Right. And when it was replaced, by the panels, which measure automatically, you would think that that would be immediate and advertisers would say, great. It took years of side-by-side -side data for Nielsen to, for advertise, for, for Nielsen to show it to advertisers before they got comfortable with switching. To the point, these notebooks got, were still used in the markets as late as six years ago in some markets. Wow. Which is like when I was little, Exactly, is a Nielsen panel. I always, I always thought there was a box or something. Yeah, is that it's a box. It's a, it's a box that's uh, connected to your to your cable. And, and how does Nielsen choose who to give that box to? I'm not sure. I think I'm not sure if you can apply to be a Nielsen household or they offer you to be a Nielsen household, and you don't get a lot of money for it. Like I'm talking maybe a few hundred bucks a year. Oh, so people like I could get paid. By Nielsen to, to put it's this. It's not going to be life changing amounts of money, but yes. Okay. I always wondered, like, who, I've never seen a Nielsen box, and I'd be always curious of what, who had this box. And there's, so there's 40,000, uh, I believe it's 40,000 uh, households around the US that have them. So it's not it's a huge percentage. Kind of lucky few. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Um, so I, I, I think the other, you know, the other um, bearish point that a lot of people make on Nielsen is just the fact that more people are cutting the cord. They don't have television. They're, they're on Netflix. They're on, you know, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera. Like they're, they're not watching TV the way like maybe yeah. we, we were kids. Um, so how relevant is, is this business? And, and, and that's why they liken it to a melting ice cube. What, why do you feel differently? So it's very relevant, especially from a point of view of how Nielsen is uh, developing and uh, where it's going, because, you're absolutely right. The audiences have been fragmenting. And I think Netflix is one case. And so if everybody ends up on Netflix, then Nielsen is not relevant because there's no advertising. 
But to the extent that advertise uh, that you know you take you can take uh, channels like YouTube or Hulu where there is where, where there is advertising, and to the extent that people are going there, and advertisers want to reach those uh, viewers, then they will need to figure out how to price that properly. But isn't that being done by Google itself? Like for YouTube, for example. Uh, like, yes, but uh, it's a but it's the third party look that's important, and actually advertisers have forced Google to get Nielsen ratings for YouTube. Oh, interesting, okay. Uh, specifically because they wanted the third party look. All of these guys historically could have provided. So a NBC could tell you, could tell advertisers, here's what people are watching. CBS could tell them, but that's not good enough. So you have uh, just an example, Netflix, I think at this point around uh, a year ago, have changed how they're measuring their audiences and their number of viewers went up by 30%. Overnight, <laughs> from an advertiser's perspective, like how can you even trust that number? Like, you, how do you, it's it's one number one day, it's not number another. So once again, they're not advertising on Netflix at the moment, I don't think. But if you were relying on one number, then all of a sudden you have to rely on a different one. So that's where where a third party look is important, and that's why I compare um, Nielsen to a company like Moody's or FICO, uh, Fair Isaac. It's where it's you can have you have the data that people can provide you on their own. A company can say, "My bond here's my here's what my financials look like," but they still pay Moody's to put a rating on a bond that is going to be an apples to apples comparison with somebody else, with another bond, and that's very important. And also, a Nielsen, I would argue that Nielsen is the only one who is able to create the right measurement for the uh, splintering audiences, and that's the product that they're working on right now called Nielsen One. That is good, That because they're getting the data, they have partnerships with Roku, they have partnerships with Vizio, and kind of, they have, I think, over 100 million different digital devices that they're able to get data from. And they're using that data to come up with a new rating called Nielsen One that will take into account both the data from linear and the data from digital devices. But very importantly, what it will do is it will deduplicate that data. So you're getting a unique identifier. You're getting a unique view into what people are watching, as opposed to trying to figure out what's going on and whether people are watching the same thing on three different devices and how do you reach them. So it's a fairly complicated process. They are going to launch this product. Uh, so they're launching this product in pieces. And uh, it's going to be launched by the end of next year. But what's very interesting is they're saying that we will launch the product next year, but we expect for at least two years to run side by side with our existing measurement to get the advertisers comfortable with it. Which we, and uh, for anybody else to come into that market and say, hi, raise their hand and say, okay, I'll give you something else that you can use. Just imagine how difficult it is where Nielsen itself is saying that we will get you comfortable with showing you side by side data. Right, so with that, Yes, news, there is there are changes happening in terms of how people are uh, watching, but as long as there are brands, advertisers trying to reach audiences, large audiences, a Nielsen rating is going to be relevant. And why is it that there isn't another um, you know name in the space that's well known here for? So you have Comscore that's kind of working on the digital side, uh, but I think it's because what that's in this, uh, I don't know what's the right way of saying it, but like this comfort that the advertisers have with this one measurement that they've used for decades at this point, that they yeah. want to continue using. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is a monopoly or just like laziness on the part of the industry. <laughs> it's hard to tell, but it seems like, it's the only game in town, um, at least for standard television. It sounds like they also have a pretty significant digital yeah. um, strategy. What What is the valuation snapshot on this? Um, so the valuation, uh, right now the company is trading around eight, eight and a half times EV EBITDA, 7% free cash flow yield. If you look at other companies like FICO and Moody's that I mentioned that I believe have very similar growth rate of around 3%, 3 to 4% per year. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's mostly coming from recurring revenue and that single source of truth. They're trading at 20 times a EBITDA or more. And this company is trading at eight. 
And one of the things that we didn't touch on yet is kind of why, uh, why Nielsen was a melting ice cube up until the beginning of this year is they had this other product that was, new, that was uh, linked to marketplace studies for consumer, uh, consumer brands. And that's a much more competitive product that they were not making a lot of money in, but it was half of their revenues, but about, I think, 15% of earnings. And they sold it. And that was a declining business. That was a truly declining, truly competitive declining business. And they sold it in the beginning of this year and have used uh, most of the money that came from that to pay down debt. And the remaining business that they have, where they have pricing power, where they have the unique positioning, has a natural growth rate of two to three percent per year. And so, what, all of a sudden, you have a company that goes from over levered and declining revenue profile to right amount of leverage and a growing revenue profile. And I think that inflection point is something that, as they continue to put out earnings that show that, that's where I think the revaluation of this company will happen. Do you think this is a, a, a good private equity candidate? So it used to be private equity owned before. That's right. why it had so much debt. It used to have five to six times uh, debt to EBITDA when, when it listed. So can it be taken uh, with now leverage being at, uh, I think it's below four. Can it be taken over by private equity again? Sure. Any other catalyst um, that you can think of in the near term? Uh, so I think it I think it's mostly has to do with them just reporting another couple of uh, quarters and showing a cleaner balance sheet and to continue to pay down debt and continue to show growth. Got it, got it. Um, awesome. Let's move on to uh, to Nutrien. <clears throat> so this is ticker NTR. Um, um, they're in the uh, uh, I guess potash and nitrogen business, but <laughs> why don't you let's call, let's call it fertilizers. The, yeah, the fertilizer business. So why don't you give us the overview on Nutrien? I think this is another interesting one. Sure. So this is, uh, I think I posted this about a year ago. And at the time, the st- like what I was saying is that, uh, look, the fertilizer prices are very low today. Uh, but if, but this is, this company continues to make uh, 50% EBITDA margins because they are the low cost producers in both, uh, in kind of their two main commodity groups. Uh, so they're making good money even at these levels. But if the uh, fertilizer prices go back to historical averages, then this company is going to be dirt cheap. And uh, over the last year, we saw fertilizer prices triple. So I wasn't, my thesis wasn't predicting that in any way, but it was more of a just, right now we have a company trading at, at the time it was trading around 9% free cash flow yield. But if you go on a normalized basis, uh, the free cash flow yield was closer to 2025. Since then, the company, I think, is up 30 to 40 percent, but the fertilizer prices have tripled. So if you keep today's prices, I'm not saying that today's prices are sustainable, but at today's prices, the company is earning over 20 percent free cash flow yield to today's price. And what are, uh, what, what are the drivers of, of the underlying commodity prices? There is a, there is a few. Uh, so one of the things that usually drives a uh, the underlying commodity price is just amount of demand relative to amount of supply. And uh, you have periods where high prices uh, generate quite a bit of uh, projects that come online later on within three to four years. And then when they come online, then you have oversupply and the fertilizer price will go down. Um, so one of the things that I was uh, pointing out in the write up last year is that we were in a period where kind of all of that extra capacity that was built up from the previous pri- uh, period of high prices was more or less absorbed by the market. And there's no new projects coming up either in nitrogen or cash anytime soon. So which is an environment that should create uh, higher prices. I did not expect it to be happening that quickly, uh, but that's, ex- that's exactly what happened. And uh, you have, so especially with uh, ammonia, the most important thing is natural gas prices. The in, and uh, that's where, because of the natural gas prices are up so much in Europe, then it became unprofitable to produce fertilizers in Europe and places like UK. And that 
reduce the current supply while the demand is going up. And the US is still relatively cheap price to produce uh, fertilizers. And uh, that's why you see prices where you see them. So let's let's break up their business. Um, so potassium is um, a big part they 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 produce uh, or sell. Um, uh, you mentioned in your report that the global demand for potash is 65 million tons annually. Um, that's growing 3% a year. Um, how, how big of uh, overall market share do they have in potassium? Uh, so I'm trying to remember that number, but I think their uh, their market share is over um, over 15 percent, and they have the capacity to they have some of the best spare capacity in the uh, in the industry. Uh, but the most important thing is that they are the lowest cost producer, one of the lowest cost and producers. That's, and that's because of their location in Canada, or what, what? What gives them that advantage? Yeah. Well, so there is with potash, there is three unique fields that can where you can produce potash in the world cheaper than anywhere else simply because of where the resource is located relative to the earth one is in canada one is in russia and one is in belarus so anybody who's producing from those places is cheaper than anybody else in the world because their potash exists in other places but it's much more expensive to produce so that's where it, it's just it's a nature of uh the Ge geology in this case. So, so um, what would it take for them to lose money on on their potash uh, production if prices fall? I mean, do they have what's the buffer right now? They uh, so they were making fifty percent margin when the prices were two hundred. So their production, uh, I think their opex per ton was around sixty. Their opex per ton is not much higher right now. But the prices for potash is, are six hundred plus. Wow! Like they they literally tripled within the last year. And and what drove that? Uh, I think it's uh, supply demand, and you did not have a lot of projects come uh, the come online that were approved within the last few years because the prices were so low. Um, and uh, you have uh, a lot of commodity prices are up low, uh, are going up dramatically right now. Yeah. So I do think that what we will see is we will have new projects being planned for potash and starting to pop up within the next couple of years. The lead time for a project for significant uh, capacity expansion in potash is quite low. It's over two years and it's pretty expensive. At these prices, it's economical. So we'll start seeing that, but the economics that they're earning today uh, should be there for the next couple of years. So if we see a decline in, you know, commodity prices, would you expect the stock to fall or, or? So I don't think that the stock is currently fully pricing in the increase in, uh, in the prices that we saw. So they are, uh, their earnings should more than triple if assuming today's prices. Uh, not all, actually most potash is not sold at spot price. Uh, it's sold based on long-term uh, agreements with places like China and India, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's a great point to be negotiating when the price is at 600. Right. Um, and then how big is their nitrogen business? The nitrogen business is about, uh, it's almost as large as uh, Potash. Uh, we're, we're talking about this is a business that's generating, uh, I think it should generate over 2 billion of EBITDA this year. Uh, and that's most of it is based in US and is benefiting from very cheap natural gas that the US has compared to the rest of the world. Are, are they a low cost producer of nitrogen as well? Yes, they're in both cases, they're a bottom quartile producer, which is kind of a key part of uh, the value proposition here. But in addition to that, I think there's other companies. So there's another public listed companies in the US that uh, called CF Industries, that is a pure uh, ammonia producer, nitrogen producer. So there's, if you want to play that, that's a different way to play it. What makes Nutrient different from uh, other fertilizer producers is actually is the network that they have, the distribution network that they have, retail distribution network that they have all over the world. So they're not just a producer of fertilizer, but they also have the direct relationships with the farmers. And uh, they build a global network of these uh, big retail locations that are working directly with the farmers and selling both their own products 
and also at providing other value added services. The, sorry, do they own retail locations? They do, they do. Yeah, and I think you had mentioned that the, the retailers are not just places to purchase, but also there's some kind of service aspect yeah, so they can help out with uh, service on machinery. They can. There's. Uh, it's not just fertilizers that you buy there, but you buy seeds. And these locations. So what's interesting is that for Nutrient, the investment into these retail locations have been a very good way to allocate capital without uh, creating significant supply in their core commodities, which you may may not have the right returns. But the incremental capital that they're putting into retail locations and building out the uh, retail chain is uh, has very high returns. And the bigger the chain, the more profitable each particular location is. It's kind of similar to like a business like United Rentals, where you have if you have a nationwide chain, a you can remove particular you can take over another uh, another retailer remove locations that are cannibalizing sales and consolidate towards the main location. And that way you drive the profitability, you drive the revenue within each location. So each acquisition that you make in, and they're growing this business primarily through acquisition is very value accretive to the existing business. How does Nutrien's uh, valuation compare to CFs? Um, I believe there is, so Nutrien is around uh, eight times uh, EBITDA today, uh, CF, is uh, usually CF trades cheaper because they don't have that uh, retail component. Uh, but actually today it's around the same eight times. But you like Nutrien more because of its diversification into yeah. retail. Correct. So I think, so for CF, the best way that they can allocate capital uh, is probably dividends and share buybacks. For them to put in additional significant new capacity is a big project with uncertain return. Mm -hmm. For Nutrien, they can continue, they do a lot of buybacks, they do pay you a dividend, but anything, uh, any money that they're putting into retail gener generates quite high returns. And uh, it, it, the free cash flow yield right now for Nutrien is, is it around 12-ish? Well, so if you look at it, uh, it really depends on what, what you're assuming as far as the prices uh, prices that they're getting. So on the historical basis, the free cash flow yield is uh, around, uh, I think around 10%. But uh, if, you add, if you assume today's prices for fertilizers, then it's over 20. Right. Uh, but, I don't think, uh, but I don't think you should be doing that. Like right. I, it, yeah. they should, at, at the average historical prices, it's around 15%. You're, 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 you don't have a strong view on underlying commodity prices. You just feel like um, even in the scenario where they go down significantly, you, they'll still be making money because of their kind of low cost. Yeah, abs absolutely. It's, it's local. And also the, that I think this company is a very good capital allocator. And yeah. that, that is part of their competitive advantage. What's the dividend yield to that? Um, the dividend yield is, um, I see, it's around two and a half percent. Oh, above S and P level, I guess. Pretty good. It is, but they also buy back shares. Right, right. Um, any particular catalyst to be wary of or to follow to track on this name? Uh, so the catalyst at this point has happened in terms of the the fertilizer prices going up. I think that the key question is how long it's going to continue. Got it. Got it. Um, really interesting. Stephen, um, this has been fun. We've covered a lot of topics between uh, fertilizer and, and, and cars and, and Eastern Europe. Um, I feel like we could go on, but I think your, your cash flow um, based approach is, is somewhat refreshing. We don't really hear much of that these days <laughs> with, uh, you know, I feel like most of the stuff you hear about um, people talk about in the news is, is, is much more of the high growth kind of high flyer type. Type yeah, it's, it's the nature of the, I think it's the, you have to go back to the investments that we've been doing in Eastern Europe is that we are in a way spoiled by the high quality companies, growth companies that are still thinking from point of view of, well, here's the cash that we need to generate in the core business that we can reinvest into, uh, re reinvest into other businesses or into growth in the core business. And uh, 
So when we talk about the uh, cash flow, free cash flow based approach, it's not necessarily that we're not going to buy a high growth company, but we want to make sure that the that the business that the company already has has proven itself as profitable. And if they generate cash that they can reinvest into uh, accelerating growth, that's just fantastic. So we're not that's allergic great. to buying. Uh, expensive name, but they have to be profitable. Right, you're uh, you're preaching to the choir. Hopefully, the, you know all of our uh, listeners uh, feel the same and 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 do their own diligence on some of these names. Stephen, we'll be following up, um, you know, over time and, and tracking these these stocks, and we're looking forward to obviously future contributions of yours on some zero. And and I would urge anyone who's who's watching to to join the community and, and check out your stuff. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you for the time, and once again, thank you for building a great community. Appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen.